Hello and welcome. I hope you're doing well. Get cozy as I share with you some absolutely terrifying Sasquatch encounters. Now, before I start, I want to let you know that on this channel, I like to share encounters that are more of a slow boil, that tend to create an atmosphere and a mood. If you're a fan of encounters like this, be sure to hit that subscribe button and turn on the notifications. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those videos go live. All right, let's get right into it. Tree spirits, please protect me. I am an artist who carves wood spirits out of pine knots and I sell them at craft shows and outdoor festivals throughout Southern Oregon. This last spring, I was up on Grayback Mountain gathering my raw supplies by breaking the pine knots out of rotting fallen trees. I knew by the signs that I was the first human to enter this remote area this year, as there were no vehicle tracks or footprints, which was normal for this isolated area anyway, because it had nothing to attract people. The nearest hiking trail was about a half mile below me, and it was not maintained, as I had to climb over and around down trees before I angled away from it. I had not been this far in before, but I found an area where the forest must have been hit with severe winds at some time past, as there were huge trees with root balls attached rotting on the ground. It was like the mother load of wood trolls, and I began harvesting my find. I wrenched one especially large knot out of its place and wrapped it three times on the log to remove the loose material. Suddenly, I heard three answering raps from higher up on the mountain. I was shocked because I knew there were not possibly any people up there because there was absolutely no way in the world that anyone could be above where I was at. I pride myself on my climbing ability, and even in the summer, I could not climb that mountain. Regaining my composure, I again wrapped on the log the same way. Not wanting to ruin my sample, I picked up a large tree limb and used it to wrap three times on the log, and almost immediately came three distinct raps echoing from above just as before. Then I made the mistake of calling out a loud hello. I heard a sound like a growl and sounds like a large animal running through the trees and brush. I knew as soon as it happened that calling out had been dumb, but too late. The only sound that came back was one loud crack from a ridge about 800 feet directly above me, then nothing but silence. Again, I heard a muffled sound like a snort, but that was all. The hair on my neck tingled as I felt I was being watched, and even though I have spent years tramping these forests and have heard most every deer, elk, cougar, and bear, this was different. I quickly grabbed a few more knots, but now I was even more uncomfortable, so I just headed back downhill intersected the faint trail, and two hours later, I was heading down the rutted trail in four-wheel drive, low range, and so glad to have it. On to the next story. My girlfriend Louisa and I had ventured into Mount McKinley National Park 
in winter of 2013 to do a little snowshoeing. It was mid-January, and there was a nice layer of fresh snow that had fallen. Our plan for the day was to follow the Foraker River up to Lake Minchamina, or as far as we felt we could go, and return before sundown. For the uninitiated among your listeners, Louisa and I are both avid runners and hikers, but the rigors of snowshoeing long distance can take even the best hikers and runners by surprise. We were about four miles into our trek, following the shoreline of the Forica River, and we were already wondering if we hadn't bit off more than either of us could chew, so to speak. The muscle groups being recruited to perform this task of snowshoeing are incredible, and we were feeling it big time. It was after about our fifth mile that we decided to turn around and head back. It was then that Louisa recommended that we do so by walking more through the timber this time, for up until this point, we had been following the river's edge. The temperature that day was in the mid-twenties, and the snow cover blanketing the forest was pristine and untouched. We were about two miles into our return trip through the timber. I was taking the lead when I saw a dead tree trunk up ahead of us. It was lying on the ground and appeared as though a gigantic firework of some kind had exploded within it, scattering pieces all over the fresh white snow. There were splinters and wood chips thrown in every direction for some 50 feet around the trunk. Although it was still a hundred feet or more away from us, it stood out like a sore thumb. As we approached the tree to investigate, we were immediately confronted with the fact that there were massive footprints surrounding the dead tree on all sides. There were two sets of prints, one being larger than the other, both coming to and going away from the tree. The two of us released ourselves from the bindings of our snowshoes so we could walk more freely around the tree. I placed one of my snowshoes next to the larger of the two prints, and the print was almost as large as the fore end of the shoe, that being well over 20 inches in length and some 10 inches or more in width. There was no doubt that these creatures, whatever they were, had come here and torn apart this dead tree. They must have been after whatever insects were held up inside of it for the winter. It was completely torn apart with just the shell of what it once was being left on the ground. The prints were those of large, bare feet with fat, stubby toes. The greater toe pointing inward at the most unusual angle as compared to our own. Louisa was first to say that these were the tracks of a Bigfoot and that she was afraid to remain there. The tracks coming into the scene as well as those that were leading away were made in a straight line. In other words, one foot was placed directly in front of the other as they walked. It was more than three ski poles distance between one of the print sets and not quite two between the steps on the other set. I would estimate somewhere between six and nine feet as being their stride. I laughed as I stood looking at the print because who needs snowshoes when you have feet that big? On to the next story. It was summer, and I was 13 years old. I was enrolled in a summer day camp in Upper New Jersey. This meant that on any given day, 
we could be on a bus to the Pine Barrens, the Adirondacks, and so forth. This day, our destination was Bear Mountain State Park in New York. For those who aren't familiar, Bear Mountain is a New York State Park located about 50 miles north of New York City and sits along the Hudson River. The park itself, which is about 5,000 acres, feels remote, even though it's not. When I think back on that day specifically, I can't recall at all that we did upon arriving at the park, but what happened later is burned into my memory. I know we went hiking, as that was something we did everywhere we went. I remember we had just hiked up a mountain or hill for those who live out west, and near the top had taken a break for lunch. At this time in my life, I was trying to be a bad boy. Example, smoking cigarettes and whatnot. Another kid and I took off from the group to go do just that. But in order to not get caught, we needed to be at a safe distance. We hiked through a patch of woods, then went up a rocky outcrop and down the other side to a clearing. As we were traversing our route, we kept hearing something moving through the woods just above us. He nor I thought anything of it. We couldn't tell if it was walking on two or four legs, and we just assumed it was a deer or something. Again, our heads were focused on finding a safe place to light up. When I think back on what happened next, it just goes to show how quickly things that seem so normal can turn to utter terror in an instant. My friend and I were joking as we went. I stopped so I could light my cigarette, turned to face him, and just as I finished making my turn, I could see a look of shock stretched across his face. His unlit cigarette fell from his lips, and without a second's hesitation, he spun around and took off running. I instantly thought he must have seen something like a bear, so I turned to see what had spooked him, only to discover that it wasn't a bear or any other animal I was familiar with, but something out of a nightmare. Towering over me, not ten feet away, was this huge, gray-haired monster, for lack of a better word. Petrified in fear, I stood, my eyes fixed on its hips, as that was where my eye level was. At thirteen, I wasn't short for my age, but I also wasn't tall. But what stood in front of me was the tallest living bipedal creature I'd ever seen in my life. It's taken me years to come to grips with how big this thing was, and now I can confidently say that it stood about nine to ten feet tall. In its enormous right hand, the creature held the remains of half a dog, a shaggy blonde Labrador by its neck. The lower half of the dog was missing. I had no idea if it had eaten it or if that part had been discarded. But the half it did have appeared to have been ripped from the other. Dried blood clung to the dog's fur, and entrails hung out of the open carcass, telling me that the dog had been dead for a while. What I found even more disturbing was what the creature held in its left hand. There, dangling from its grip, was a garment or blanket. It was hard to tell which, but it told me that it had encountered someone else before it had run into us, which begged the question, where were they? Had it come upon someone walking their dog? Had it killed them and then ripped the dog in half? Where was it taking this half-dog back to others like it? 
My mind spun with so many questions, and it screamed at me to do something besides stand there. Filled with terror, my mind raced as to what I should do. I knew I needed to run, but I couldn't. I was frozen, unable to move. I had a clear and unobstructed view of the animal. Its chest was broad and muscular, spanning about five feet, and was sparsely covered in hair. Speaking of the hair, this thing wasn't the typical black, brown, or red that most people talk about. It was covered in thick gray hair, and the area where the hair didn't cover fully, its skin was brown. Its arms were long, thick, like tree trunks, and muscular. This thing looked powerful. I had no doubt that it must have found the dog and simply ripped it in half. My mind kept telling me to flee, but something in me wanted to look at its face. I know it sounds odd, but I had to. I needed to know what it looked like. Conjuring up the courage, I raised my gaze and for a brief second locked eyes with it, but couldn't hold my stare out of fear. What I saw was something familiar, yet not. Its face reminded me of a gorilla or ape. It was large, round, and brown, and hair didn't cover much of it. Its nose was flat like a gorilla's, and its teeth which I was able to see due to its mouth being half open, were not unlike ours. It had big, square-like teeth, but I didn't see canines. That didn't mean they weren't there. I just didn't see them, as its mouth was only cracked open in what I can only describe as a sinister sneer. Its eyes were large and black, yet shaped like a human. But the stare it gave me told me in words not spoken that I wasn't welcome there. I presumed what it was thinking, but I have no doubt it was angry with me. Was I in its territory? Did I pose a threat to it? I couldn't see how. I was small and weak compared to it. On its face, it bore scars but two were large and distinct, one on its furrowed forehead and the other across its cheek. I wondered years later what could have caused those. Had they come from fights with others, or were they just the remnants of a hard life in the forest? I fixed my gaze back on its torso. I couldn't help but stare at it. Its gray hair was matted in places, sticks, mud and leaves clung to it, but without any doubt, its hair was fully gray with patches of silver. I couldn't fathom how something so large could have walked up without us hearing. How was it possible that one second it wasn't there, then the next it was standing ten feet from me? My questions were stupid, as it didn't matter. It was there, and I needed to make a run for it. I rediscovered my courage, turned, and sprinted back the way I'd come. I didn't know if it was coming after me, and I didn't hear anything. But then again, I never heard it approach us. Each step I took, I thought could be my last. I had no doubt that if it wanted to get me, it could. My heart raced, Lungs burned and legs ached as I tore back up the rocky outcropping, back down the other side, and into the area where the others were. Everyone sat around, talking and laughing, their lives seemingly happy with no concern. My eyes darted around until they settled on my friend, who was sitting on the ground, shaking. I could see the terror was still on his face. Standing above him was a counselor who, no doubt, also saw his fear and was trying to talk to him. We didn't discuss the incident until we were both back on the bus heading home. I asked him what he thought about it, and his only response was to shake his head and turn away. 
which told me he didn't want to discuss it at all. I've spoken to him years later, and, like that day, he still won't talk about it. There's no doubt in my mind that, like me, he still suffers from our brief encounter. I have nightmares, and when I discuss it with anyone, those nightmares increase in frequency. Like many others who've come into contact with these creatures, my experience, those ten seconds, have turned into a lifetime obsession. I have done research on it, gone back into the woods. However, I have my limits, and as the more I focus on it, I relapse and become consumed by fear. I know many like to say the creature is harmless, and I'm sure some are. Like humans, there are some that are benevolent, and some others that aren't. These are animals, and they're also predators. There's not a doubt in my mind that some people have been killed by them, hence all the missing persons cases from national parks and forests over the years. When I think back to that day, I can still see the one I came up against holding that garment. Whom did that belong to? Had someone else come face to face yet wasn't as lucky as me? I'll never know, but I am grateful that I did see it and survived. I know it sounds weird to say this, even though I know I suffer from my experience. I still wouldn't have it any other way. The one thing I've taken from my encounter is this. These creatures do exist and aren't just in the deep forests of the Pacific Northwest. They also haunt and call home the swaths of land and woods near cities and towns along the eastern seaboard. So, the next time you go to a park and think it'll just be a normal day of hiking, just know that in an instant your perfect bluebird day could turn into a confrontation with a monster who has an appetite for dogs. I hope you enjoyed those stories, and if you did, be sure to hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. I post new videos every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday, and if you have your notifications on, you'll be the first to know when those go live. Again, thank you so much for watching the video, and until next time, bye!